Welcome to this week's edition of World Crisis Radio. This is Webster Topley speaking to you from Washington, D.C. It's the afternoon of Friday, June 19th, 2015. And the world is in deep trouble. Uh, we're headed towards a possible breakdown of the world financial system because of the pig-headed stupidity of Merkel and the austerity ghouls around her featuring Schäuble. And we'll get our report from Athens, uh, if all goes well, a little bit later in the show. Um, we also have a very disappointing and sad uh, development on the ideological front. We'll, we'll talk about that in just a minute. Uh, let's focus for a second on Ukraine and Russia, the big strategic picture. The problem we have here is the continuing bellicosity and constant meddling, even pinprick meddling, uh, is uh, very dangerous in this context. The United States has now announced that the uh, heavy equipment, the tanks and artillery for one brigade uh, armed forces, ground troops, ground forces, that uh, one, heavy one heavy brigade is going to be pre-positioned in the Baltic states. This is supreme folly. This is enough to be a, a provocation. It's certainly not enough to be anything more than a tripwire on the ground. It literally makes no sense. And in response to this idiotic provocation, really more self-destructive than, than threatening, President Putin of Russia has said, well, if this is the case, we're going to have to increase the number of missiles that we have pointed uh, essentially westward. And uh, that's our compensation. And then looks at the camera and says, really, what are we supposed to do? You're constantly bringing this stuff closer and closer to our borders. Uh, we cannot simply ignore it. It's coming on and it's threatening. So pre-positioning the equipment for one brigade gets you 40 to 50 ballistic missiles. Now, whether those are intercontinental or not, I'm not exactly sure. I think some of these are going to be put into that uh, exclave, from the Russian point of view, the exclave of uh, Kaliningrad, right? This is the old East Prussia. That's Königsberg, Immanuel Kant's city. But that's where the missiles are because that's uh, the farthest west that the uh, that the Russian Federation extends. So those are being put uh, into place. Now, let's just look at the undoubted facts of the situation uh, before we go into some some interesting speculation about Secretary Kerry and what happened in Sochi, and then what what indeed what may have happened to Secretary Kerry after that. Uh, let me point out that the people in Europe are paying a lot of attention to the long and detailed interview that Putin gave to the principal Italian daily newspaper, Corriere della Sera. Corriere della Sera has just had a new, uh, a new boss put in. The director, or oh, the old director is out. The new director is in. And this, uh, interview was conducted on the 6th of June, 2015. So what? Almost two weeks ago. And it's continuing to have uh, many, many implications uh, in, in the European political situation. Uh, Putin says to Corriere della Sera, this is their headline, I am not an aggressor. This is a summary. Uh, but I'd like to have uh, a treaty arrangement with Europe, and I've got to have parity with uh, the United States. Okay, uh, Putin goes on to say, we will develop our offensive potential, and we will have to think about systems that can overcome the U.S. anti-missile defense. And he's pointing to the fact that the U.S. denunciation of the anti-ballistic missile treaty has forced him into a logic of needing these U.S. Uh, 
advances or threats, as he sees them, uh, through uh, corresponding countermeasures on the Russian side. Now, this is interesting because, remember, there's a Russian-Italian special relationship. Right? It goes back, goes way back, but just in, in more recent years, right? In the 1960s, the very reactionary Dr. Valletta uh, of Fiat uh, put a large truck plant and uh, automobile plant into southern Russia, right? This is the so-called Fiat Lada or Lada Fiat 124, also known as the Lada. And you'll still, you still see those on the roads in, in Russia, as I noted a uh, couple of uh, weeks ago. So there is a special relation. Now let's, let's go, let's see what the, how this special relation is holding up. Uh, the relation took in recent years, very recent years, the form of a personal friendship between Putin and Berlusconi. This, as I've stressed repeatedly, this is why Berlusconi was targeted. He was a friend of Putin and he tended to defend uh, Putin against some of the charges that were being launched against him in the secret councils of the Eurogarchs and Eurocrats, the Brussels gang, uh, and, and the rest of it. So uh, he had to go. That's why there was a coup d'etat in November 2011. The International Monetary Fund, Monti, Goldman Sachs, all of them involved in ousting uh, Berlusconi. But now let's look at the uh, the newspaper that tends to reflect uh, Berlusconi, the one that, that supported him the most among the main ones. That is Il Giornale. Now, there, there's no love, love lost uh, uh, by them on me, right? They have slandered me because of 9-11 and, and some other things. Okay, fine. So let's just take a look at what's going on more more recently. Here's a columnist of Il Giornale, Marcello Fa, and he says, Putin is basically right. And he stresses, in international relations, you've got to get the big picture, the strategic vision, and then you can actually uh, evaluate uh, the details. So he quotes at some length uh, of his own experience, first of all. He says he, he's been covering Russia for the past 25 years. And he says, in these 25 years, in effect, I have never, ever had to cover a single international crisis provoked by the Kremlin. No. Instead, what I saw was the progressive and often passive uh, pulling in of the horns by Moscow. In other words, uh, going to smaller scale activities in geostrategy and uh, at the same time, though, the development of a new Russia starting in 2000 using the uh, the uh, increased prices of oil and other uh, uh, natural resources and that Russia was mainly concerned with trying to uh, gain prosperity. Now, long interview, he wants to quote the following. Uh, Putin says, Russia never speaks in conflictual tones and uh, uh, about we never do that with anybody or about any of these questions. And he says uh, he cites P Prince von Bismarck, right, uh, 150 or 125 years ago. Um, what is important is not the talk, but the potential. And then he says the uh, military expenditures of the United States are superior to the military expenditures of all the rest of the world put together. And those of NATO are 10 times more than the Russian Federation. Russia has practically no military bases abroad. The uh, Russian policy is not global, offensive or aggressive. You should publish in your newspaper the map of the world showing all the U.S. military bases and ours, and you'll see the difference. Back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. At World Crisis Radio, Webster Top Lear in Washington, D.C., we're just going through this um, highly interesting interview by Putin to the Italian newspaper Milan Corriere della Sera. That was the 6th of uh, June, and the echoes are continuing here. Il Giornale, different paper, right? more right-wing, more Berlusconi. But nevertheless, the line is, Putin is basically right. 
Uh, this is now a common theme around Europe, and we're going to see how this uh, moves the entire uh, process. Uh, is there reason to fear the Russian bear? Well, Putin says, look at the facts. Uh, we haven't... Uh, we haven't been uh, pushing our uh, bases in any direction, and instead NATO has been expanding to the east. We have not been moving in any direction. We have not been expanding in any direction. It's rather the NATO infrastructure that keeps getting closer and closer to us. Corriere then asks Putin, do you deny that there's a threat to NATO? And he says, only an insane person, only a lunatic or Someone who's dreaming, right? A somnambulist could imagine that Russia could ever attack NATO. To come forward with this idea has no sense. It's completely baseless. Maybe somebody has an interest in feeding this kind of fear. I can only suppose it. Uh, I imagine, he says, I don't think the U.S. wants Russia and Europe to get along well. Uh, but anyway, Russia is forced to respond. Uh, we don't know what they're doing uh, or why. We know what they're doing, but we may not know why. So we have to uh, respond in these uh, in these ways. So he says, let me tell you, there's no reason to fear Russia. The world has changed to such a degree that today reasonable people cannot imagine a military conflict on such a vast scale. We have other things to do, other things on our agenda, I guarantee you. And then the this Il Giornale center-right Italian commentator says, these are the words of a leader who is not looking for conflict. It is clear, he goes on, that Putin is waiting for nothing more than to be able to close off this crisis with the United States and to get back to being considered an economic partner on the global scale. There is no new imperial Russia. There is a Russia that is attempting to get uh, allowed back in, readmitted to the international community and to be able to participate once again in the G8. To find a deal solution on Ukraine is not difficult, but you've got to want to find it. And this is the president. And uh, the Corriere has also uh, carried the comments. The, the uh, former Italian president, Giorgio Napolitano, ex-president now, right? the guy who uh, essentially piloted Berlusconi out of office. Even Napolitano, writes this, car, this uh, commentator, even a hardcore Atlanticist, a hardcore NATO backer like Giorgio Napolitano has certified the good faith of Moscow based on what Putin had told him in 2013 and which Napolitano transmitted uh, to Obama, but uselessly. Uh, now, whoever is uh, proceeding with intellectual honesty should rather... Uh, inquire, what are the geostrategic objectives that the United States is surreptitiously and, in my opinion, uh, recklessly, dangerously uh, attempting to uh, obtain? Why did Putin, why did Obama decide to uh, reject the outstretched hand of Putin by threatening new economic sanctions and a, missileless, a, a missile escalation in Eastern Europe. That is not the way to uh, obtain security for the world. Okay, I think that's, that this is a, this is a right-wing Italian uh, uh, commentator, and I think this is uh, largely uh, accurate. Now, there was then this question about Sochi, right? Um, I pointed to it that there was this meeting in Sochi, the six hours of Secretary of State John Kerry, Foreign Minister Lavrov, and President Putin. And the idea was some kind of a modus vivendi, a way of getting along on questions like Syria, but also Ukraine, Donetsk, the People's Republic, and so forth. Uh, and before this was starting, right, there were these headlines. This could be a re-reset. 
and so it's about the middle of May. So it's about a, a, a month uh, back. And uh, after this, let's see if we can find some good uh, quotes for you here. Uh, after this occurred, we had uh, statements from from uh, Kerry in particular telling Pornoshenko, right, the madman, the fascist dictator of Ukraine, was told by Kerry to cool it, that somehow an understanding was beginning to emerge, a way out of this crisis, uh, a path towards uh, something better. And Kerry was telling the uh, this awful Pornoshenko to quit it. Uh, and then, however, things got turned around. Now, this was the subject of an appearance by uh, Stephen Cohen, Professor Stephen Cohen, yesterday, I believe, that would be the 18th of uh, June on the um, Russia Today Network, uh, Oksana Boyko, I think. Um, so, on the 12th of May, Kerry warned Pornoshenko to cease to stop his threats, to stop talking about Crimea, to stop talking about Donbass, and uh, and essentially uh, get ready for peaceful solutions. Uh, then, however, we have Victoria Nuland, right? This horrible, odious uh, uh, warmonger witch. She comes out and says, "We reiterate our deep commitment." to a single Ukrainian nation, including Crimea and all the other regions of Ukraine. Uh, and uh, that's uh, that's Newland. Now, uh, a real secretary of state would have fired her the same day. A real president would never have uh, have gotten it uh, gotten it in there. Um, speaking at a news conference. So Pornoshenko is continuing. He wants Crimea back speaking at a news conference on June 5th. Pornoshenko says, every day and every moment we will do everything to return Crimea to Ukraine. It is important not to give Russia a chance to break the world's pro-Ukrainian coalition. Well, it may be wide, but it's not very deep, Porno. We'll be back in a minute. Welcome back to the World Crisis Radio. Needless to say, you're going to find everything... Uh, that you hear on the program developed in more detail at Topley.net. Topley.net. You'll also find uh, books of mine. By the way, if you want to get some good lines of investigative research, opposition research on Jeb Bush, you got to get that Bush biography of 1992. That's a while ago, but uh, I still had material about Jeb Bush being implicated in Iran-Contra drug running and gun running. And that was when he was the Miami-Dade Republican chairman. And then a little bit later, when he was the Secretary of Commerce of the state of Florida. Because remember, George H.W. Bush had two essential machines, right? One is the one he created in Texas, starting from Houston with tough Tony Farish and the rest of these hacks and operatives. But he also then had, as a good CIA man, George H.W. Bush had that entire political operation. It was essentially the political cover on CIA Miami Station, J.M. Wave. That's all in the Bush biography. So if you don't have it, you better buy it. And all you... You know, 20 Republican campaigns out there. Oppo research guys, you want to make your life easy? Go start, start off with that, uh, that book of mine and you'll find all about Jeb Bush and Don Aranow, the gangster, the drug smuggler, how Don Aranow's mysterious death, mysterious murder somehow helped Jeb Bush to remain uh, unsullied by the kinds of scandals that otherwise were about to come down on his head and so forth. So, uh, yesterday on this Oksana Boyko, that was again the 18th of June, Stephen Cohen says, Sochi came and there were the beginnings of a deal, the first thing being to tell Pornoshenko to cool it, 
Uh, but then after Newland came out with her tirade and her bellicose and Russophobic statement, then the Sochi uh, agreement seemed to fall apart, right? That Sochi really no longer uh, existed, um, possibly. And who's doing what to whom, right? Is it, uh, some people say, Biden? Because Biden, of course, Biden has Hunter Biden, right? His son is a speculator and uh, ripoff artist trying to uh, trying to enrich himself at the expense of the people of Ukraine. We know from the um, the visit that I had with Boris Litvinov that Hunter Biden came in there and said, "I want to buy your coal reserves," and the answer was no. Yet, and that's the kind of language that uh, Hunter Biden. And the rest of these imperialists simply do not want to hear. They want the bowing and scraping of these uh, characters like Pornoshenko or Yatsenyuk or uh, some others. So uh, there's also the question then, what happened to Kerry? A uh, lot of speculation. I wouldn't join in it except to say that there is some opinion that what occurred uh, with Kerry was not so much that he was – uh, cycling or that he had a spontaneous bike crash near, I guess, the French Swiss border as he was there for various talks, uh, but rather that, uh, something was done to him. Now, the done to him could mean all sorts of things, right? What kind of a, an event could put you in the hospital for a couple of weeks, assuming that's, that's, you know, that he really was, uh, you know, in, in, in under a doctor's care in a hospital. Uh, it could be that somebody made sure that his bike crashed, or it, then it, it could be that there's more violence involved. Just remember, there are some forces that apparently care very, very much about these sanctions. As soon as you talk about ending the sanctions, uh, there are certain groups that go wild, as Hollande found at the beginning of January when Hollande went on the French radio and said, we've got to end the sanctions against Russia. Well, then uh, look what happened. That's the Charlie Hebdo story. Right? That's what occurred. So it's perfectly possible that um, Secretary Kerry had a bike crash uh, that was assisted uh, as a result of this um, stuff that he had been saying. OK, so we can't decide that if people know something about it, hard facts. That would be highly interesting, but you get the idea. Um, so this is what's going on. Now, the other side of this thing, the increased conflictuality, has to do with uh, Greece, and we're going to talk about Greece at some some length, but um, the idea is Greece has, uh, the, the Greek Prime Minister, Alexis Tsipras, has made the trip to St. Petersburg. Now, this is an area I, I actually uh, visited precisely this exhibition ground. Uh, when I was there, it was for something called Panorama Berlin, which was a uh, kind of reenactment, a three-dimensional diorama that you'd walk through of the uh, Soviet Red Army arriving at the uh, Reichstag in May of 1945. And that was a highly, highly interesting thing. And I'll have more to say about that in the, in the near future. But uh, so the same area is now the scene of the uh, it's the St. Petersburg International Economic uh, Forum. So Tsipras went there, met with Putin. And what could come out of that? Well, I would hope, as I've said repeatedly, the new BRICS bank is a great thing, but you got to use it. You can't just keep it on the mantelpiece and keep it polished. If you've got the BRICS Bank, finally, even rather late in the day and even on a smaller scale than we needed, well, then use it, right? Let them play the role of the IMF, right? The IMF gives you a certificate of good health, right, of, of uh, respectability, and then other lenders will lend to you. Well, let the BRICS Bank do that and then let some Chinese banks or others – Make some loans to Greece. That would be a good idea. Now, uh, we'll have to follow that closely, right? Because there, there, there's a couple of things. One is next week, 
we're going to have a meeting of the European Union, foreign ministers, I think, or, or prime ministers, right, heads of government, and that's going to be about do the Russian sanctions get extended, yes or no. We have now reached the one-year mark on these idiotic, counterproductive, uh, misbegotten Russian, anti-Russian sanctions. And then, of course, that has brought in the counter-sanctions right, against agricultural products and food. Uh, nobody imagines that these sanctions have had any serious effect. As I said, when I was in St. Petersburg, a distinguished educator said, the average Russian has no idea that there are sanctions, right? Russia is so huge and so diverse that these are pinpricks. Nobody knows. And he said, you could even have uh, a decline of 1%, 2%. Nobody would notice. He said, you could have a decline of 15%. And the Russian people would not be seriously phased by that, right? They would continue on the current course because they understand what it is. At the same time, their anger is rising against the hypocrites and the practitioners of the double standard. So that's next week. If Greece is um, being treated really badly by the European Union, the Eurocrats and Eurogarchs, and the Euro zombies that uh, control them, uh, then Greece might say, no, we veto any more sanctions against Russia. They could do that. I urge them to do it. Uh, of course, it's a comple complex uh, calculation. Then, however, there's this other thing. The countermeasures seem to include uh, economic warfare that has escalated. Um, we're talking Yukos, and I guess that's Khodorkovsky. Remember him. Khodorkovsky said, uh, I'm the richest man in the country. I should have a coup, kick out Putin, and become the prime minister. And the answer to that was, no, you go to Siberia for 10 years. We'll be back in a minute. Webster Darby here in uh, Washington, D.C. Now, we want to get our report from uh, Greece. The stories we have here uh, that the uh, various forces have organized a, a modest run on some Greek banks, uh, two, two billion dollars or euros in the last uh, three days or so. Tsipras has gone to St. Petersburg for the uh, St. Petersburg International Economic Forum, met with Putin. Um, Russia is disposed to provide help, but not no specifics so far. It also looks like one of the uh, the Russian uh, gas pipelines is going to go through Greece. So that's an important uh, dimension. The sanctions vote in the European Union is next week, and the uh, the question now is: Did uh, did Cyprus get some help? Did he get some assurances of help? Is he going to be um, able to uh, to use the uh, the support from Putin in some way as a uh, as a means of bludgeoning the Eurocrats and the Eurogarchs. Let's go to our uh, excellent correspondent in Athens, Michael Chitinis, and get the lowdown on all that. Michael, welcome. Hello, Webster. Uh, well, Putin didn't give any specifics, but of course we know that thing that uh, things are. Uh, should to be discussed, to have been discussed. And um, a memorandum of uh, cooperation on this pipeline was signed, uh, including a full financing by Russia of this pipeline. And this is interesting because we have yet to see if this pipeline is going to become a reality this will, this is a huge thing and it's, 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 it has come so fast that I'm not sure about it because it, it brings Greece <laughs> to, in a place of, um, clashing with NATO in, uh, unprecedented ways. So we'll see about that. And this is, this, there's a possibility that this might be a, just a negotiation, um, uh, Thing, so uh, Varoufakis was at the Eurogroup meeting of uh, Eurozone finance ministers Thursday, where he presented. Well, he tried to present uh, yet another realistic, very realistic Greek proposal, uh, but he was interrupted, 
and wasn't allowed to present it in the end. Uh, the proposal had, had new mechanisms that would guarantee primary surpluses, so no new austerity, um, but a temporary debt restructuring without a haircut, simply to put an end to the month-by-month bailout installment hunt and inevitable continuation of conditionalities. You know, like a, drug, like a drug addict that would agree to anything just to take the next dose. So this would put an end to it uh, and open the road for investment uh, uh, from, the, uh, from the European Investment Bank and open and calm things down so that discussion for the viability of the Greek debt and the inevitable haircut may start. Uh, but they don't care about it. You know, Varoufakis' proposals have the unbelievable merit of being the both reassuring for the European taxpayer and bringing hope to the Greek people. If this proposal was to be agreed on, Syriza would become the absolutely dominant party um, of the political field in Greece. And that is, in my view, the reason why the Europeans refused to accept it. Instead, they made leaks that supposedly the Greek banks would remain closed on Monday. This, this, is, a, this is a direct attempt to invoke a panic, mm-hmm. to foment panic in Greece and bring the government to a tough situation where it would sign anything just to keep things calm. Uh, this is not going to happen, I'm afraid. The Greek government, this uh, Greek government, as I see it, is not going to be blackmailed. Now, they have called for a special EU summit on Monday to discuss the Greek issue. It seems like, once again, there's not going to be a deal. Uh, They will try to foment panic and then have Tsipras surrender on Thursday at the regular EU EU, uh, meeting, summit. I don't think it's going to happen. But are they really prepared to let a Grexit happen? Absolutely not. And that's why they believe they can blackmail, simply because the Greek government doesn't want it either. So a simple default will have a bad short-term uh, effect on the Greek economy without the threat of Grexit. So they are trying to squeeze without bringing it to the point of a collapse of the Greek banks. Here we have to say that there is, as you said, a mild bank run in progress already. But here's the interesting thing. The ECB, the European Central Bank, came in again today with yet another ELA extension. ELA is Emergency Liquidity Assistance, as it has done almost every week till now. And once again, it saved the Greek banks. So the ECB, while not providing normal liquidity, because it has stopped accepting Greek bonds as collateral the minute Syriza was elected, it has nevertheless pushed huge amounts of emergency liquidity that the Greek banks operate with uh, these last four months. So who's afraid of a collapse, really? And what will happen to the Spanish and the Portuguese and the Italian bonds if Greece were to, de- were to default June 30th? We need to see I this. think the, the other thing, Michael, to add to that is now this question of the Ukrainian default looms very large. So Greece by itself, one thing, if you add in these other places, right, add in Portugal and Spain, but then if you add in Ukraine, you get a, a much, much bigger shock that I don't think they have any way of being ready for. Yes. Uh, uh, tr- um, will Mel- Merkel really become the chancellor to break up the Eurozone? I don't it's, think so. uh, it's it's not a winning uh, resume, is it? <laughs> yeah, of course. Helmut Schmidt, the former chancellor, uh, says today Greece must get a significant haircut and a big investment package. Uh, uh, Tremonti, uh, the, fo- the former finance minister under uh, Berlusconi, uh, came out this week supporting the kind of policies Syriza is calling for. So will Merkel become the chancellor to break up the eurozone? I don't think so. <laughs> but but in order in order not to do it, she has to make concessions. Well, given the hard line she's kept until now, how can she make any concessions without guaranteeing a huge political win for the left in Europe? And we also have this uh, crazy Madame Lagarde, as we call her, Lagarde. Look that one up. 
uh, and Lagarde is saying, you know, we, we will give you nothing. We won't give you a day of extension. We have to have adults in the room, right? Insu- insults left and right. So Merkel has a hard time getting back from the brink because Lagarde is standing behind her and pushing over the brink. Yes, and whenever you hear uh, someone barking like that, uh, it means they're in a tough situation themselves. So I, I don't know who's in a tough situation uh, the Greece, <laughs> the Greek government, or themselves, because they're going to be humiliated uh, if, uh, if another failure comes to the IMF uh, record. Um, so I think Lagarde is pushing for exactly this reason because she's afraid of losing yet an, yet more credit. Uh, the IMF losing even more credit because no one mm. wants the IMF anymore to be. Uh, <laughs> Um, to, to come into their country. Nobody wants to submit to conditionalities or memorandum or letter of intent, right? That's, that's, uh, the kiss of death. Yeah. So where, where can this lead? I don't know. Uh, but June 30th is coming and I find it far from impossible that Greece is going to default. And I, as I see, as I see it, it would be a good thing, I think, because it will force European politics to politicians to clear things up. You know, is a default a deadly sin? Do we break diplomatic relations with someone who's, who's bankrupt? <laughs> what is this, European ideals? Um, it, it would uh, bring some, it would be cathartic, I think, for European politics. I don't think we need to have an exaggerated fear because even after a default, there would be some days when these people like Merkel could come to their senses and say, okay, we're going to finance you to stop a world panic. Okay, thank you, Michael. We'll see you next week at the same time. Michael Chiatinas in Athens, our excellent correspondent. And we'll be back in just a minute on World Crisis Radio. Welcome to the second hour of World Crisis Radio. And again, it's the afternoon of Friday, the 19th of June. And now we have the uh, sad task of uh, pointing out the significant errors that have crept into the most recent uh, papal encyclical. Uh, this starts off with the promising reference to St. Francis's canticle of the creatures, right? Laudato si. Be praised. Uh, but unfortunately, the conclusions that we find here are not in line with the urgent needs of the world economy and above all the people that are on the brink of uh, starvation or needless death. And indeed, we ought to remind ourselves that the principal problem of the world is this number. It could be 30,000 or 40,000 or 50,000 people who die needlessly every day because of starvation, malnutrition, these kinds of useless deaths that can be avoided for pennies uh, still claim, and we ought to find it in the United Nations Human Development Statistics, um, very large numbers of um, victims. We have to first deal with the uh, reality or not of global warming. Now, it's quite possible that there is global warming and that it is due to solar activity. This is the overwhelming conclusion to which I, for one, have come. There probably is some warming going on. It may or may not be exaggerated. But in effect, it's something that comes from solar activity, and it's part of a natural cycle, uh, which we have seen, for example, at work in the medieval warm period from about 1000 A.D. to 1200, 1250 A.D. Gets us back to the time of the Magna Carta, which we were discussing last week. But there was this uh, medieval warm period, right? This is the time when the The Vikings or the Northmen or the Norse uh, adventurers were able to spread out across the North Atlantic, reaching places like Iceland, Greenland, uh, Labrador, parts of uh, Canada, and so forth. And it's the time when vines were growing. Right? If you get to North America and you call it Vineland, well, then that's uh, that's precisely what what we're talking about. That it's warm enough for that kind of that kind of situation to. Obtain. We're going to continue this in just a minute, but we're very happy to 
be joined by Reverend Edward Pinckney from that Michigan prison system where he is kept as the number one political prisoner here in the United States. Reverend, welcome. Honor and a privilege. And I tell you, yeah, you you said it right. I'm here at the Lakeland Correctional Facility. I'm being held as a hostage. That's what they're doing. And we just have to make sure that we're doing the things that need to be done. Um, I, I just got off the phone with, with the attorneys, and everybody is excited. We're ready to roll. Within the next 10 days, we will be at another level of dealing with this this, this corrupt system. So I'm, I'm, I'm feeling good. And um I, I, I'm well, so, Reverend, will that be a hearing? Will that be uh, – what, what exactly well, are we talking about without giving away any of the trade secrets? That will be a foul. We will be fouling, fouling for the appeal bond at that time, and uh, and then they, they're they going to take a look at it, and then they're going to have to make a decision when, when, when uh, I will have a hearing in reference to it. So it should be early, early. I'm looking early, early, early July. Whatever it is, it is, you know. My goal is to make sure that I'm doing all the things that need to be done to make sure that people understand that we're exposing a corrupt system that's we're built on corruption, and we have to let the people know, which is far more important uh, than anything else that we might even think about. So uh, I'm, I'm just doing what needs to be done. That's, that's all it is. I'm, I want to be an example for other people that, you know, that, uh, uh, that have to go to prison. Uh, uh, and, and actually is innocent of all charges and, um, and, and just to show the world what we can do because I'm expecting to win this case uh, overall and I'm expecting to show them what we can do and show the people that corruption can't be stopped. And in the meantime, this is, of course, the prison industrial complex. This is the mass incarceration of black people, poor people, uh, and so forth. It's this system which really looks more and more like the concentration camp system, right? You put people at the lowest possible uh, standard of living, and then you expect them to work, and, and that's for profit, and uh, it's looking uglier and uglier. No, it's, and, and, and nobody will believe that, you know, that some of the stuff that, and some of the ghost stories that goes on, you know, when you think about this criminal justice system, uh, uh, you, you talk about a, a system that has 2.3 million people uh, 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 locked up, and... Uh, and it's going to get worse before it gets better, unless the people from the outside. See, it's not really the people on the inside. It's the people on the outside have to speak for the people on the inside, because that's who they listen to. They do not listen to people that's locked up. So we have to make sure that the people on the outside understand how important it is, and we need them. We need them to speak up. Uh, right now, what I'm doing, I'm, I'm putting a group together. Uh, I'm expecting to have a visit today from uh People from, from Wisconsin coming in and uh, from uh, uh, different places, uh, uh, Lansing, everybody want to come in and, 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 and do some work. People are moving in that direction to, to show that, you know, that, you know, that just because a guy is in prison, that will make him a very terrible, terrible person. So we're, we're moving in, in all kind of uh, directions to show that we can, we can do some things. And people are really interested, which is, I'm, I'm, I'm shocked to hear how, how, how people turn their back on people that's in prison. And, and you're certainly right. So let's re remind people that the way you make your voice uh, be heard is to go to bhbanco.org, BH Benton Harbor Banco Black Autonomy Network, Network of Community, Community Organizations, organizations right. dot org, mm -hmm. and look a little bit on the lower right hand side, there's a PayPal. Make a contribution, and Reverend, you can you memorize your address better than I can. So that's yeah, the other way to do it: is to send it right. in. Nineteen forty Union, Benton Harbor, Michigan, four nine zero two two, Banco B A N C O. And 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 uh, I want to say this, Webster. Uh, I want to thank you uh, for all the hard work that you have done. I want to thank Danielle and Jeffrey. And I want I want to say this to Jeffrey: if you happen to speak to Jeffrey. Tell him to email uh, Tim, and he's going to send him a, 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 a brief uh, so he can take it a little bit. But we want him to work on it, not just, you know, read it and say it's good. We want him to, to give a reply back. That's what we want to do. And uh, within the next week or so, we plan to uh, definitely file and get it, get it moving. But we need it done. We need lawyers who are willing to stand up. We need lawyers who are willing to go the extra mile. That's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for people who are not afraid to stand up to this corrupt system. When I talk about Barron County, I'm talking about a criminal enterprise. That's what they are. 
they're a criminal enterprise, and they've been doing the same thing for years. They've been doing doing people this way, but we have to make sure we're moving in the right direction. And this is something we can do, Webster. This is something we can do, but we have to stand together. It doesn't make a difference whether you're black, white, red, yellow, brown, it, or any other thing, the color that you might want to be or, or want to say you are. If we work together, we can win. It's more of us than them. We can win this battle. And, uh, and I want all the listeners to know this. We're not just here spinning our wheels. We're here fighting for justice for all. And the people here in prison, we have to make sure that we put their arms around them. I want to make sure that when they get out of prison, they'll be able to go out there and tell people, I was in the penitentiary, but getting still, I'm still a man. Absolutely. Let me also point out the statement from Judge Ferdinando Imposimato of the Italian Supreme Court, the Corte di Cassazione. This has attracted a lot of attention, and I, I spoke this week to a religious leader from the Boston, Massachusetts area who has been uh, supportive in the past and is now going to do more. Uh, and part of that is in the wake of this uh, Imposimato statement. So Imposimato is not going to be the only guy signing that uh, that statement. We'll be getting we'll Very be getting good. more as the time goes on. Absolutely, and I read that, and it is tremendous. I I, I was amazed. I, I just love it. it. It shows what we can do when we work together. It's it's it's, it's a thing. It's, you see, it's us against them. That's that's what most people don't understand. It's us against them. It's not black against white. It's not Mexican against Puerto Rican. It's us, us, us. It's us against them. And once we get that in our heads, then we become a force. Then we'll be able to uh, elaborate on other things, do other things, and learn to work together. But well, Reverend, we got this hard break coming in, dictated by the computer. Hang on, we'll see if we get another minute or two before that alarm clock goes off. Back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Here we are again. Let's see if we have another couple of minutes with Reverend Pinckney. I'm here. Great. So, uh, again, uh, you were, you're, I think it's, it's time to start uh, putting together these uh, first-person uh, accounts that you've been giving us and some, something about, you know, what, what, what are the abuses and the horrors of Governor Snyder's prison system there in in michigan right which ought to be one of the leading states and instead it's uh it's it's leading in these t terrible conditions absolutely you know it, it, the sad part about this whole situation is is not, not the food is, is is terrible uh on june 2nd um and at jackson penitentiary they found a, a magnet magnet in the in the food uh several dozen of them and then they didn't steal, they served them to the prisoners, and the prisoners became sick. And not only that, uh, 125 people got, got uh, food poisoning. And it's not just that facility, the one in Ionia, another 125 got sick. People are getting sick every single day with this food. The food is so terrible that nobody seems to go over there and want to eat it. They, most people would rather stop and eat the food. Like, and this is this is all due to this company Aramark, am I right? That, that, that is correct, Aramark. Aramark is the one who's in control. And here's the sad part: they will not get rid of Aramark. They got a contract that's supposed to be coming up for renewal, and they talk about Aramark said that they want to raise, <laughs> which is the biggest joke that you ever want to hear. And and uh, I, I, I tell you, every single day here at the prison itself, if, if it's not one thing, it's another. They have taken away some of the rights of, of the prisoners themselves, like you get yard here and stuff like that. Uh, they make the decision when they're going to call yard, when they're going to do this. Uh, 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 every single day that there's something being taken away from the prison, and they don't even know it. But the, the key thing here, uh, is Webster, is that the people have come so complacent that they don't, they don't feel like they can stand up and fight these folks. They feel if they do, that they might retaliate. You see what I'm saying? Sure. I don't the word retaliation is is definitely part of the thing. They got all kinds of things that they they do that they take away from you. Uh, 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 they, they 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 put you on what they call LOP lawful privilege, where you can't you can't go outside, you can't do this, uh, 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 and and they keep it that way. And not only that, but here's here's something else. You get two uniforms to wear. Two. For the whole time you're here, 
you know, there's no such thing as, as going there and, and, and having them replace and stuff like that. They give you uh, three pairs of socks, and uh, the socks are so thin, they tear up after three washings and stuff like that. Oh, it's, it's, and the shoes is almost like walking walking uh, barefooted right outside uh, in, in, in the streets. The shoes are so bad. But the point is, they're selling these things. If you lose them or anything like that, you have to pay uh, the regular price that they pay. They were paying the store for this stuff. You have to pay this. They take it out of your any money you receive from the outside. So we're we're balling here, and 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 and, and, and the guards themselves, they we got some guards that are so mean that uh, you wouldn't even want to talk to them unless it's uh, 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 I mean unless it's a truly emergency. So we right. you know, we got it bad. But I try to, what I try to do, I try to stay out the way. I try to just do what I need to do. I stay in the law library all day and come back and I sleep. And I just try to stay out of their way. And I make sure I'm in the bed between 8.30 and 9. And uh, I wake up early in the morning and I, I go straight to the law library. And I, I just stay in there until I get things done. But the point which is more important, we, like I said, we're still waiting on the February 27th transcript. And the you have one minute remaining. We're down to one minute. So let me let's minute. give that website again. You can go to bhbanko.org, and or you can you can mail a check to Banco B A N C O 1940 Union Avenue, Denton Harbor, Michigan 49022. And I want you to write me here at Lakeland Correctional Facility, the penitentiary itself. Please, people out there, write me. And most of the time, if I don't write you back, it's not because I'm, I'm ignoring you. It's just that I'm so busy right now I'm trying to get this, get myself out of here that, you know, that it's more important that we do what needs to be done. So I want to thank everybody for all your support, especially with you, Webster, you, Danielle, Jeffrey, and everybody else. This is an opportunity that we can all pull together and win this battle. This is a war. This is no conflict. This is the real deal. So we must stand up and show them what we can do, and we're not afraid to stand up and Okay, Reverend. I guess that's the uh, the cutoff there from Aramark or Rick Snyder. But in any case, uh, a lot of people are, are pulling for Reverend Pinkney, a lot of people working for him, right? We can focus this in, in a larger context. You get the idea, right? There's a prison industrial complex and there's mass incarceration, and now you're getting an idea of what this is like uh, at the ground level. So... Uh, we now need to change gears. Um, starting again on this question of the encyclical. Um, the encyclical, again, starting with uh, this question of uh, St. Francis. And, of course, St. Francis was uh, – so he's the patron saint of ecology as, as of late. And uh, he's also the guy who uh, was most appreciative of uh, – Animals and uh, and nature. However, we've also got to look at the uh, the reality of the world, right? That that thirty, forty, fifty thousand a day. We want to get an updated figure. And again, there are conflicting uh, estimates. Um, we've got to first of all let's let's do a, a brief uh, theological argument, if we can. Uh, in the encyclical. We find paragraph 65, without repeating the entire theology of creation, we can ask what the great biblical narratives say about the relationship of human beings with the world. And in the first creation account in the book of Genesis, God's plan includes huma humanity. So the creation accounts of the book of Genesis contain in their own symbolic and narrative language Profound teachings about human existence and its historical reality. Um, there is a rupture between mankind and nature caused by sin. Okay, uh, St. Francis was trying to heal the rupture, as Bonaventure later wrote. Uh, however, now we get into a problem area. We are not God, okay? The earth was here before us, and it has been given to us. This allows us to respond to the charge that Judeo-Christian thinking on the basis of the Genesis account, which grants man dominion over the earth, Genesis 1.28, has encouraged the unbridled exploitation of nature by painting man as domineering and destructive by nature. 
And we'll be back in just a second on World Crisis Radio. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Now, looking at this key question, right? How do you reconcile the beginning of the book of Genesis and the imperatives created therein with somehow a new path now emerging from this encyclical? And uh, are these compatible? So again, uh, the encyclical says we have to respond to the charge that Judeo-Christian thinking, Western thought, <coughs> on the basis of the Genesis account, which grants man dominion over the earth, has encouraged the unbridled exploitation of nature by painting man as domineering and destructive by nature. Now, this is already mixing apples and oranges. This is not a correct interpretation of the Bible as understood by the church, although it is true that we Christians have at times incorrectly interpreted the scripture. Nowadays, we must forcefully reject the notion that our being created in God's image and given dominion over the earth justifies absolute domination over other creatures. Well, how does that even come into play? And then we find, I think, the most problematic of all, the biblical texts are to be read in their context with an appropriate hermeneutic. Well, hermeneutic, uh, I think, fine, but uh, that's not going to uh, transpose something into its opposite. So the hermeneutic is that uh, be fruitful and multiply means till and keep the garden of the world. Tilling means cultivation, plowing, while keeping means caring, protecting, overseeing and preserving. So what what are we talking about? Um, the, the centerpiece is, here we have the nice uh, Latin uh, Vulgate. So, uh, creavut deus hominem ad imaginem suam ad imaginem dei creavit illum masculum et feminam creavit eos. And so God uh, creates man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. Benedixit que ilis Deus et et crescete et multiplicamini et replica, replete teram et subicite eam. So God blessed them and he said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Means fill the earth, <laughs> replenish the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every other living thing that moveth upon the earth. Now, of course, this means earth for humanity, that earth in every, uh, the earth and everything in it is uh, a, you know, a tremendously important natural resource and asset of humanity. So we're not advocating pollution. Uh, the other idea is that it seems that the encyclical text seems to lapse into the idea of a fixed uh, universe with fixed energy inputs. And there's a lot of uh, Catholic thought in particular that goes in a different uh, direction. It would say that, as I would say, that the stability of the earth is not a fixed quantity, but it's a meta stability. In other words, it's a series of phase changes that gets you into a more and more advanced energy configuration, higher levels of energy, higher levels of organization and self-organization. And when I think we go wrong is uh, it's some other quotations here that uh, we find uh, we must use the Earth's goods responsibly, fine, the German bishops, again, a, a group of pessimists, if there ever was one, have thought have taught that where other creatures are concerned, we can speak of the priority of being over that of being useful. The catechism clearly and forcefully criticizes a distorted anthropocentrism. Well, uh, some of these bishops may be verging on a kind of pantheism, which I think is maybe more uh, dangerous um, there's uh, only three quotes from Genesis in this entire thing, which are far outweighed by quotations from the recent, uh, pontiff, pontiffs, uh, John Paul, St. John Paul 
the second calling for a global ecological uh, conversion. Uh, and then we get to the following kinds of analysis. These problems are closely linked to a throwaway culture, which affects the excluded just as quickly as it reduces things to rubbish. Paper needs to be recycled. Fine. Um, we need to have uh, uh, different systems of uh, agricultural organization. Okay. We have not yet managed to adopt a circular mode of production capable of preserving resources for present and future generations. The fact, quite simply, is that some resources cannot be preserved, and the path of human progress is to go on to redefine other resources uh, as you go from the limited scale to what could now be an interplanetary uh, economy. Uh, we need to limit as much as possible the use of non-renewable resources. Again, this is, a, in my mind, an artificial and misleading distinction. Moderating their consumption. Now, again, if you're concerned about third world poverty, and I am, uh, how do you how do you make that coexist with a call to limit consumption? The whole idea of consumerism. Uh, you're telling the advanced countries, so-called the rich countries, they're not really rich countries, and indeed most of the people in the so-called rich countries are anything but rich that they should limit their use of non-renewable resources, moderate their consumption, maximize their efficient use, reuse, and recycle to counteract the throwaway culture. Um, again, the only way you can help the 30 to 40 to 50,000 who die every day is through a massive increase of production in all the principal elements of food, clothing, shelter, uh, medical assistance, water, there's a lot of emphasis on water, and that's good, but the way out of the water crisis is not to try to distribute water, although you can do some work with distribution, ultimately, you're going to have to produce more fresh water, you're going to have to desalinize uh, the oceans around us. So I think uh, the church has rightly said that human life has dignity and sanctity. But you cannot make that coexist with the calls to lower consumption. Uh, we don't need a lowering of consumption. We need an increase of consumption across the world. And the idea that, uh, that this is all somehow due to carbon is a... Uh, extremely controversial idea, in my view. Uh, the, the encyclical cites a kind of uh, scientific consensus. No, that's a scientific consensus among uh, mercenaries, right? If you have a degree in climate science, that means you have bought into global warming in the current form. It's like saying, again, I've, I can only think about history – if you, if, if you had a PhD in anti-Russian history or a PhD in pro-French history or whatever it is, somehow it's a, it's a discipline which is loaded from the word go. So unfortunately, these people, uh, have somehow influenced the Catholic Church in Latin America. I would regard this as somehow a, an echo or a, uh, a return of some of the excesses of liberation theology. Fortunately, the encyclical is not infallible. The question of papal in, um, infallibility is exclusively very short propositions in faith and morals, which this is not, in my view. It's not faith and morals, and that has to be done with a special act. So this is all open to debate, so let the debate begin. I'm doing my part. Back in a minute. Welcome back. This is the last segment of World Crisis Radio here on Friday, the 19th of June. Now, we couldn't let our program come to an end without attempting to do justice to the buffoon who has now come on the political stage. Yes, indeed. It's the Donald, Donald Trump. Now, obviously a demagogue. Uh, I think equally, obviously, a megalomaniac, delusions of grandeur, a narcissist looking for adulation, and uh, looks like there are some people ready and eager to be duped, right? Maybe you were duped by Ross Perot, 
back in 1992. Maybe you were duped by Obama. Maybe you were duped by Ron Paul. Maybe you're duped right now by Rand Paul. But the I think the most grotesque of all the Wall Street Pied Pipers is Trump. Now, this reference to uh, to Ross Perot, I think, is important. Uh, you got to remember 1992. You had the end of the Cold War, and a lot of people thought, okay, now we want to see a peace dividend. We want some fat back, right? We want somebody to bring home stuff for us. That was essentially the Pat Buchanan group in the uh, Republican Party giving Bush a hard time, Mad Dog Sr., and the Jerry Brown people and the Democratic side. And when those collapsed, there was about a third of the U.S. electorate that had nowhere to go. So out comes little Ross Perot, right? Connections to the CIA, connections to the U.S. Treasury, to the Federal Reserve. They used him as a, a guy to prevent Wall Street panics by buying up things like uh, DuPont, Glorforgan. You can read about that in uh, Surviving the uh, Cataclysm. But he comes out there. He gets everybody together into a movement. He starts telling them that the main issue is a fake issue, deficits and debt. Uh, but it's not, of course. That's not the real issue. But... Perot is the guy who authored the essential program of the entire uh, Republican Party. So he gets them together. He leads them out into the desert. And then he drops out, drops out. Remember, Perot was ahead. He was leading Clinton and Bush, the elder, in the polls. He dropped out from July, from the end of July to the beginning of October. And then he came back, right, just to make the uh, the humiliation uh, complete. I'm thinking that uh, this is what Perot uh, is going to give to Trump. In other words, a model for how to destroy a lot of the anti-establishment activists of a whole generation. Now, we're joined by Daniela Walls, the president of the uh, the chairman of chairwoman of the uh, tax Wall Street Party. And I'm wondering, Daniela, you got any well, people, new people ideas about history. Perot? Well, people forget their history quickly, right? That was in 1992. But if we go back and we read about that campaign, the similarities are almost startling. And I was really shocked that people I thought were intelligent and mature, they wrote to me in the last couple of days with disgusting, drooling, fawning praise over this disgusting Trump. And I'm really re revolted that people still don't have the ability to dig any deeper than the surface and media hype and see for themselves what's really going on here. So once again, it's our job to do this for them. Your job, Webster, these uh, are the same people, like you said a moment ago, that were duped by Obama and that wasn't enough for them. They were duped by Ron Paul and then Rand Paul and that wasn't enough. And now they're hungry to be duped again by this guy with the hairpiece. But I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm still you too young. We do this. One of the ways we do this is through the morning briefing, right? Yes. And people need to know there is a morning briefing, right? And it's effective and it's good. It may not be exactly every morning, but it's uh, most days we have it out there. How can people there's, subscribe? Well, there's to not this? enough time in this 10 minutes for us to go through the entire party analysis we put together of Trump. We put together a four page briefing on this guy last night that uh, was today's morning briefing. Friday, June 19th. We'll have more on Trump in the morning briefings to come. This will be an ongoing analysis of all these guys coming out. This weekend, we're also covering Jeb. To subscribe to the briefing, go to TWSP.us, and there's a button right on the side that says subscribe. Armed with this analysis every morning, we think you guys can't go wrong. To join the party, write to join at TWSP.us. Our morning briefing is being disseminated widely. At least 10 online newspapers publish the briefing every morning and also many blogs. And not notable broadcasters have written to both you, Webster, and I that they rely on the morning briefing to make their own news reports. Okay, and just a, a couple of other things about, about Trump, right? Here's somebody who says Greece is unsalvageable. When you want to see what a pig this character is, right? He's a neoliberal. He wants... A small government, he says, the role of government has to always remain limited, you know, marginal. We don't want big regulation. We want everything so that, you know, sociopaths like him can run wild. He's telling us that Greece is unsalvageable. Well, why should that be? But In the he 1990s, relied on those same dead haircuts to bail him out when during his exactly. numerous bankruptcies. 
So this is where the hypocrisy mm-hmm. comes to the fore, right? The megalomania and the hypocrisy that he got a, a, a billion dollars of debt, maybe not exactly debt forgiveness, but a delay in when he had to pay it. But he did that. Uh, he got the right to put second and third mortgages on all of his silly gambling casinos, right? He's been bankrupt four times, and he's up there saying, I'm so rich, I'll run the government like a business. Well, will you bankrupt it four times in, what, 10 or 20 years? Um, it's just, it's it's unbelievable. In but other words, Greece is unsalvageable, so the same rules don't apply to him. No, and then we get into this question of war and peace, right? He obviously hates Iran, uh, with a passion. He does not want any reasonable uh, way of uh, preserving the peace in the Middle East with the cooperation of Iran. He's against that. Seems to be a big friend of Netanyahu. And uh, not so long ago, he called for the bombing of North Korea. The U.S. should bomb the DPRK, Pyongyang, uh, as a means of preventing them from making any uh, nuclear progress. So you're dealing with a guy who his stock and trade are these throwaway lines, right? I believe we looked at his website. There are no issues on the website. So he's the two feel, most he important can feel sections, free to change. The two most important sections, issues and program, don't exist. It's all media and entertainment. The only tabs on his website are TV appearances. And he's all about making negotiations and the art of the deal, but he says he refuses to make a deal with Iran. And of course, if you don't make a deal, uh, the deal, by the way, may, it may actually have a chance, right? That's a little piece of news on the side, right? The Iran deal may be gaining momentum, right? Again, with, with Putin helping it along. Um, but with Trump, there, there would be no way. Now, the other thing is a lot of people were duped by this 35% protective tariff. What he means by that is the following. When he says 35% protective tariff, he means that's a threat that he can use in uh, beating down political opponents or other opposition. He cites the president of Ford Motor Company. He said, I'll threaten Ford with a 35% tariff on the uh, cars they're assembling in Mexico and shipping back into the United States. Uh, some years ago, he wanted to use a 25% tariff to force China to let their currency uh, increase in value, right? The the artificially low value of the renminbi, he said, was, was uh, facilitating Chinese exports into the U.S. But you see, he doesn't really want to implement the tariff. He doesn't want it. He wants it as a threat. And when these other people back down, right, you say, OK, I'll put my bazooka back into the closet here because you've given me what I want. He has no idea of a regulated, orderly economy where a measure of protectionism would be a permanent part of the thing, right, to prevent, uh, you know, unexpected threats. And he says, I am a free trader, says Donald Trump. The problem is is if he doesn't put the tariff in as a structural feature of a well-regulated economy, then that leaves it up to Trump, which companies he decides to personally threaten with the tariff. It's, like you said, being used as a weapon, not as a structural feature that's that's of a well-regulated economy. I guess we, the only thing we can say is that people actually have a hunger uh, to be duped, right? The, pe- the, the people who were duped by Perot, that's getting, I, I guess th- those people are no longer on the scene, right? That, again, it essentially destroyed a generation of, um, of possible anti-establishment uh, activists, right? You lead them into the, into the desert, you, you abandon them there, and they have nowhere to go. Uh, and that's going to, I think... You can see that Trump, you know, he's run for office, right, four or five times. He said he would run for president. He never did. Governor of New York twice. So it's just not not reliable. Well, that's so, your job to undo them. Thank you. And we'll, uh, again, that morning briefing uh, is, is a good way for people to take part. Thanks so much to Daniela Walls, the chairwoman of the Tax Wall Street Party, who's going to be joining us uh, in the future for a number of interesting uh, activities. So with that, we got to end our program for today. See you next week.